Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to meeting number two of two, uh, Village Plan Review, uh, public engagement session. Uh, so, uh, welcome. We're really glad that you've taken the uh, time to come out to the meeting this evening. And uh, even though the weather isn't the greatest, so we always don't know if the, if the, if the rain or the sun, if we get more attentive to public meetings of rain or sun. But anyway, thank you, thank you very much uh, all for, for coming out this evening. Uh, so my name is Chad Hahn, the Director of Community Development and Recreation for the Municipality, and I'll be uh, your meeting facilitator for this evening. Uh, so I'm just going to run through a, a few logistics to get us started. So uh, there are washroom facilities just out in the hallway. Uh, if anyone needs them, and we do have, of course, our exits to the side and to the rear for emergency purposes. Uh, we do have a few meeting snacks, so if you need uh, water, if you stretch your legs, or uh, have some refreshments at any time, feel free just to, uh, to get up and, and help yourself to those items. And as well, we do have a couple of printed maps at the back of the room, so we'll have those same maps will be up on the screen this evening. Uh, but if you'd like to uh, look at those a little bit closer, uh, sometimes it's easier to read it in the print version versus on the screen. So, so feel free to uh, refer to those maps at the back at any, any point as well. So for an agenda this evening, uh, it'll be very similar uh, to our, the meeting that we held uh, a couple of days ago. So I do see some familiar faces in the audience, so we will be following uh, the same format that we did uh, for that meeting. So after our kind of welcoming introductions here, we'll be uh, turning the mic over to our senior planner, Gareth Sturman. And uh, Gareth has a series of, of uh, slides, a slide presentation to run through with you. And so he will be providing some background on kind of how we get to this point today. And then as well, the process from here forward to the kind of final approval of documents uh, at some point in the future. And as well, we will be going through the changes. So from the, the very first draft that we had, uh, in the public engagement session that we had previously, and then the changes that were made uh, up to the, the second draft. And so uh, uh, hopefully that uh, any of you folks that were at some of those meetings in July, hopefully you'll see some, some changes reflected in the comments that we heard uh, during those sessions. So that's the uh, schedule for this evening. And then of course at the end, uh, if there are things that, have, uh, that didn't come up during the presentation that you want to make comments on or ask questions about, uh, we definitely will, will, uh, will stick around at the end for, uh, for a kind of question and answer period. So, yes. With regards to the agenda, on the agenda, the item of water was listed. Yes. But at Tuesday night's meeting, it wasn't really dealt with until I raised it at the end. Sure. Mm -hmm. So could we advance that? Because I know many of us are gravely concerned about the water. Yes. Uh, could we move it up the agenda? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. We can, we can do that. We can capture that early. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so just by way of a, a few introductions this evening, so uh, we have a, a few municipal staff here uh, as, uh, as support for the, the meeting this evening. Uh, so we have uh, Jennifer Weber is looking after kind of our, our IT, and we are uh, uh, doing a live broadcast on YouTube of the meeting this evening, so we want to make you, uh, make you aware of that. And then uh, afterwards, if you want to go back and, and, and review the meeting or uh, pass the, the information along to any of your uh, neighbors or friends that would be interested in viewing it, and you can, can do that afterwards uh, on YouTube. So I just want to make you aware of that. Uh, we do have uh, Darlene here. Darlene is taking some notes for this evening, and, uh, and Heather, our, our development officer, is here as well, and she's here too. Uh, if there's any questions that, that come up, she, uh, she's the one that uh, in the office that can, uh, um, goes through and does some of the approvals of, of our uh, development. Uh, application, so, uh, so Heather's here to, to provide, uh, provide some of that uh, support as well. And lastly, we have Terry McGuire, our CEO, is here as well uh, to listen to the conversation. And, uh, and again, if there's any questions that come up uh, that she can help out with, uh, she's here to do that. And uh, I'll also just mention that so Derek Wells, uh, Councillor Wells, who is our Councillor for District 3, um, he popped in here, you may have seen him a minute ago, so he just had to scoot out to an appointment, uh, but he'll be back in a few minutes, so he'll be here to, uh, to hear the majority of the, the conversation and the questions that, that, that you uh, have this evening. Uh, okay, so lastly, I uh, just want to review some kind of basic meeting principles that we just want to quickly go over, uh, just to make sure that our evening goes smoothly. So we would ask uh, one person speak at a time, and that's for your benefit. We want to hear what you have to say. So if there's multiple people speaking, uh, we, we may not hear. 
And so there isn't an option, as Jennifer is reminding me, that uh, there's a microphone in the center here. So um, if you would like everybody to hear you and project your voice instead of it's recorded uh, on, uh, on the, the video stream, uh, you can step up to that and use that microphone back if you, if you like. So I just wanted to let you know that that's here. And if you have questions or comments as we're going along, please just raise your hand and uh, either Eric or I will, will acknowledge you and, uh, and we'll kind of keep things going kind of in, in an orderly fashion that way. Um, we also want to make sure that uh, we would encourage you to uh, feel free to ask whatever questions that you have. Uh, you, no, no questions are, 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 are inappropriate, uh, I guess. And we will make sure, well, I don't know if I worded that right. <laughs> <laughs> feel free to ask whatever questions are on your mind. About that. <laughs> uh, but we would ask that you please be respectful of other people's comments and questions. Uh, we do know that uh, with some of the topics that we have this evening, uh, not everybody is going to agree on uh, on uh, on one particular perspective. So uh, so so please please be respectful of, of other people's uh, opinions as uh, as we go through the evening. And lastly, before I turn it over to Gareth, just want to let you know that we do have a, a parking lot, so we know that there are lots of topics that will come up. There's a lot of uh, municipal projects underway right now, and so if questions come up that uh, aren't specifically related to planning, uh, we don't want to lose those, and we want to pass those, those kind of questions, that information along the council, uh, so we will record that in the parking lot and make sure that, uh, that we don't miss that or so that we don't, don't lose that, so we want to make note of that. And, uh, and as well, some of those parking lot items or other things that uh, uh, folks can feel free to reach out at any point to their local councillor or uh, we have meetings almost every Thursday morning and there's a public input session at every meeting at, uh, at 845 and so uh, you can feel free at any point if you want to feel you want to speak directly to council. I just want to remind people that that option does exist so just want to, want to put that up there as well. Uh, so unless there's any, any questions right now, uh, I'm going to, uh, going to turn it over to her. Great, thanks Chad, and uh, yeah, welcome, welcome everyone, thanks, uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I guess since the, since the question about water came up first, before we even get into the slides, let, we can, we can uh, address that. Um, the, the planning strategy, obviously, water and the availability of water is something that is related, um, and a lot of these issues, like Chad was saying, if something comes up that's not directly related, the planning strategy, in, in a lot of ways, relates to almost you know, many different types of things, and water is definitely one of them. But the planning strategy is also not the solution necessarily or the document that's going to result in a water system or, or not. So um, basically what I've got in terms of updates on water is, is the latest from Public Works and from Council in terms of the initiatives and efforts that are underway. Um, so I'm happy to share those with you uh, in terms of if, if there's, we'll try to do our best to answer questions, but if there's specific details, we may have to refer you to the Public Works Department. Um, for updates on that. But basically, um, for anyone that was aware, there was a, an, an effort uh, underway in the Middle River area to do some test wells to try to determine if there was sufficient quantity and uh, quality of water that would potentially be a water source here for the village. Uh, just recently, in the last month or so, a report has come back to Council to confirm that unfortunately the two test wells that were drilled uh, did not yield good results in terms of even just quantity before you get to quality. Um, and so that particular initiative has been, we, that's essentially the end of that. There's, there's not a good prospect of finding water in that area. Um, but uh, the Public Works Department has identified a new area to explore based on some old reports that were found and, 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 uh, and reviewed. Um, and essentially that is in the Robinson's, uh, Robinson's Corner and Marriott's Cove area. So that is, is very new, uh, but that investigation and work is underway. That will likely involve, potentially involve discussions with landowners, um, you know, if there's not a piece of municipal land that's suitable. Uh, so there's, there's lots yet to happen there, but that is the, the direction, I guess, or the, um, the, where we're looking now to find that, that source of water. Um, along with sort of some of those updates that came back to council, there was also uh, an update on Spectacle Lake, which again, you might be familiar with as being previously identified as a potential drinking water source. Um, there were always going to be treatment needs for Spectacle Lake where it being surface water, uh, so that, that hasn't changed. Uh, but what sort of I, at least to myself, what kind of new information did come forward in the report was that the lake itself, in terms of the quantity, would only be able to support roughly 2,000 residents, not households, but actual people. 
Um, and so between the village and the outer areas, we're, you know, we're almost there. That would really give us no capacity to, to grow. And the cost of the system for 2,000 residents would be, would be very expensive. So um, similarly, it appears that uh, Spectacle Lake is, is not going to be a viable source. Uh, and council has asked staff to bring back a report on the land use controls around Spectacle Lake for consideration for potential rezoning. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. Like I said, this discussion was just about a month or so ago at council. Um, the other piece uh, that, that is, again, not, this is not a, a solution, but this is uh, something you might be aware of. There's currently there's a bottled water program uh, that gets initiated when uh, in summers we're, we're at a certain quantity or threshold of wells uh, run dry where the municipality will give up vouchers for bottled water. Obviously, that's not a, a permanent solution, it's a, it's a temporary solution. Uh, and so Public Works is currently in the process of reaching out to uh, a large number of community organizations, community halls, or other types of um, community organizations that have a physical uh, building in the community. And they're looking for interest for which groups might be uh, willing to partner and provide a source for a community well. So it would be maintained by the municipality, uh, but it would be available to the public, basically as a place that you could build up and fill, fill up jugs or, or water jugs. Um, so those kind of bullet points are the updates that I have on, on water as of today. Um, I, I will open it to any questions, but like I said, I may or may not have the, the details that we'll be looking for there. The, um, the potential place for the community to source water, is that an emergency situation or would that be all year? I think the intent would be that, that would, if so, the first thing is we have to get the, the hosts to agree to that organization and, and figure out how that would all work. But the intent is that would be available year round. Yeah. So um, I know there are informal spots like that in other communities where it's maybe just a spring or something coming out of the side of the mountain. You can go fill up. It would be like that, except you would have the assurance that it was being tested and monitored by the municipality, so it would be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Just as we're going into discussing these. This, planning my overall impression is that there is a focus on increasing density more population more ability to have more people as we're doing that water the availability of water is obviously key so i'm just going to ask that when we're talking when you are making your presentation um it seems to me it's a it's kind of an iterative process but without water you can't have the density so why are we focusing on that if we don't have the water? Yet? So, um, yeah, so I guess a good point of clarity is to do a little bit of explanation as to what the current rules for development are. Um, so there is, if you took the current rules and the new rules, the, the, the number of units is actually quite similar. Currently, any home that's built before 2004 in the village, which is most of them, uh, could be turned into a two-unit building as of right. And in some zones, it could be turned into a four unit building. So that's something that's called residential conversion. It's not widely known, uh, but that is there and exists today. So all these homes that you see could just be turned into a two unit. So what we've done in the, sorry, in the new plan uh, is we've, we've removed that residential conversions piece because it is a little bit confusing and it also ties to an arbitrary date of basically when our last plan was, was introduced, which was 2004. Um, so what we have done now is we've uh, outlined basically in which zones you can only have a single unit home, and in which zones you can have a two unit home, or in some of the other zones you can have more. Um, and then in addition, you can have what we call an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and so that, in effect, you're basically, those properties that could be turned into two units now, you could still have two units. So, um, yeah, so it's, in terms of the overall potential number of dwellings, I'm not sure that it's a, a significant increase. Um, you're right, water is definitely a concern. and. Um, uh, I guess a couple other points to that. Um, anything that's of a larger scale uh, in the plan and that's identified to go through either a site plan approval or a development agreement process. Um, development agreements involve public meetings like this and a negotiation between the council and the developer. Um, in, in the case of any of those larger, more intense kind of developments, we, we, we do have the ability and it's written in that we'll be requesting um, studies and, and other types of reports on on the water uh, situations there's policies that say that before the development agreement is approved council needs to be satisfied that there's both water to serve the development and then also that neighboring properties wouldn't be negatively impacted as a result of the development so for the larger pieces we've got that 
for these smaller ones like the accessory dwelling unit, we, we, we aren't asking for um, sort of a, a professional report prepared. Um, I mean, I, there's, I think there's an element too of, you know, typically when somebody's going to invest, they're going to they're gonna make sure that they have water before they build, but that doesn't necessarily take care of the neighboring property owners. That's the problem with me. Yeah, so it's, I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry, I'm just, I just wanted to make a point. This isn't in the village, but in the comments, they're proposing a 24 unit, two bedroom housing complex beside my mother-in-law. She already runs out of water, but they've been assured that there's gonna be enough water for this project. So I just wanna say that whatever rules are in place, the rules are there, but the water is, is not. Yes, there. Yes, but, so Sorry, I don't know how much. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, just, I just wanted to say that. And again, it's the common, so people may not be as concerned as the village, but I just wanna say that there's some like inconsistency in yes. how the rules and the water, how that plays sure. out. Garth, you, you, you quote or reference uh, um, the, the statutory, the, 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 you know, the, the split dwelling. Yeah, yeah residential Is it provincial? No. That's in your village land use file as day. So it's right. easily changed. Well, this is the process that's changed the first two. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not to say that it has to, that, that number of no, units has to stay here. Yeah, sorry. For a new effect, I thought that was that. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, so, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So, so at this point, we could that actually change it so you, that wouldn't be allowed, so it, it would make more sense until we get one. Um, yeah, so if the, if the consensus uh, and if council agrees that, that we should reduce the amount of density or, or the potential density, I guess, if we're saying, you know, um, that, that, yes, that, that, that any, any of these roles are up for you know discussion. And, and, yeah, are there any councillors here? Do you want to yeah. 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 No. So, I, so I think what I'll, what I'll do is uh, Glenn, we know this is a really really important topic, um, and uh, through our previous public engagement sessions, that this topic came up as well, and so. Uh, we do know that our council is very, very aware of the water issue as it relates to this plan and, and as it relates to just general life in the village. So I'm going to, so it, it, it's directly related to what we're doing here, but I'm also going to record as a, as a parking lot item just to emphasize. And so, and we did regard to that the last time after our, our uh, sessions to emphasize to council that it, it is repeatedly coming up as a, as a topic of interest in the community. The, the community is extremely um, concern about the, the water issues within the village. So I'm going to note it on the parking lot uh, here so that it, and it, it is being captured in the notes as well. So we'll make sure that that, that message gets through to council. Tara? I just want to, I, I think this is correct, Garth. The um, project in the Commons, I believe, has to go through a development agreement yeah. process. There's, still, um, it has not happened, correct? But the no, water was approved by the province. Uh, no, so we do have a report for that that says that there should be sufficient water. It also says that test wells will be required to prove that quantity, and, and that's all going through Nova Scotia environment uh, due to the amount of water withdrawal that they'll be needed in that, in that specific case. Uh, but yes, that is going. But the issue was at the public information meeting, there was um, the report was not the purpose. Okay, was not. Believed, I guess. Uh, yeah. I just have something to add. We keep talking about going to the councillors, but the development in the Commons was proposed from Derek Wells to Anne Andre, um, and then they went to John Risley, got the property. So I just want to say, like, going to council to me doesn't sound like it's going to be effective when two of the councillors are the people that are proposing the development in my particular area. Exactly, invested. Andre's an investor. So I'm sorry, I don't want to hijack this meeting. But I mean, we're going to get like just written over there and don't start talking about it. Okay. We're going to try to keep it to one. So there's a question in the back. And then... Yes, folks oh, are right. Yeah. Yeah. I think I just would want to make clear I think some of the concern is that um, when the water issue goes to council, kind of articulate what that is. Um, I think the, the belief is that the concern is that there won't be enough water and it, they kind of jump to the step of let's source other water. But I think the messaging here is that we shouldn't increase density or allow for that until it's been determined that that's what's even wanted. Yeah, On the right. piece yeah. about um, councillors voting. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Given how fragile we all understand the water situation. Yeah. Be, 
Yeah, and I just want to say, like, in terms of um, sort of due process and transparency, we do have a conflict of interest act. So if you feel that there are concerns with who's voting and for what, that can always be raised. Yeah, okay, good. And I just want to make that clear because any any small village, it's very easy to have conflict of interest, but you should be aware of your protections yeah. that are available there if you want to express them. Yeah. Thank you. This isn't specifically about water, <laughs> um, but I just want to clarify something that you had said. It, it sounded like you were saying that you're trying to reduce the number of permanent residents by reducing the number of families that could live within a, a house? No. Oh, sorry, that misunderstanding. Oh, yeah. okay, then yeah. I do misunderstand. No, so currently, um, every building, that, this was a- Oh, I'm response. sorry, no, I misspoke. I don't mean reduce the number, I mean reduce the potential. Um, so no, so, so there was a comment, the, the first comment that's been reiterated a few times is that there shouldn't be an increase in density until we have water. Yes. And what I was trying to reiterate is that actually the rules that are in place today compared to the rules that are <clears throat> proposed here are, are similar in terms of the overall number of potential units that could be built or right. be created. Right. So, so yeah, I, that's what I'm yeah. trying to clarify. So it's, um, you're saying that a house right now mm -hmm. could become two to four potential uh, yes, split, right? Yes, basically split. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so you're trying to prevent that from happening. Well, we've removed that specific ability because what that did was it picked favorites between people that were here before 2004 and somebody that built in 2005. And you know, if you build in 2003 versus 2005, one's going to have this ability to create it, at a minimum two more units, or two, sorry, two total units, and one is going to be just stuck with the, the single unit. So what, what the new plan does is it doesn't tie to a date. Um, it allows every every lot to have one, what we call an accessory dwelling unit. That could either be like a basement apartment, uh, or it could be a, what people might call a garden suite, like a building, a small building in the, in the back. And those could be permanent dwellings for people. Yes, that would be okay. the intent. Yes. What I'm hearing is Airbnbs. No, that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> it sounds like we're saying yeah, actually, no permanent that's a perfect residential. I'm ready to the land use, because that's, I've got a slide on okay. exactly okay. Okay. So, so if, 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 if the granny suite gets built, the owner will go to best and highest return. It always happens. And if there's a regulation? We took away, okay. when this started, we were told the Airbnb, or the uh, granny suite would be controlled. Yes. And now you've taken away the control. That's no the council yeah. didn't have the nerve or the, the will to to pursue the Airbnb uh, issue. That's not so now, what, that's not accurate. Um, what they told us last night. No, it's not actually. I have a slide on that. Do you want to go? So so what I what, I, what, I, what, I, what I'd like to ask a specific question. Yeah, if let's I talk buy about a granny it. suite, if I build a granny suite, what are my controls? You said there were none. Okay. No, that's not what I said. Can we have the speakers come to this microphone so we all can hear? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to put a, just put a pause on this for right now. So we are going to be visiting the short-term rental issue. And so what I'd like to, us to do, if we, if we could, is to hold those questions. Because a lot of the questions that are come up, they're going to actually be answered through some, some, some presentation. And so as we go through the presentation, uh, we'll, we, won't, we won't flip, we won't miss that one. We'll, we'll make sure we address that at that point in time. And then uh, that'll allow Garth to get through his slides. Uh, otherwise, the time is ticking, and we're not we're not going to get through. Uh, I mean, the, the other thing is, this is your meeting, so you know we're here until nine o'clock. We can do this all night, or we can go through the slides. Yeah. That's so, so I'd like, yeah, so I like I to go through the slides, Garth. Yeah. Can we can go through the slides, and then and then we'll we'll. Uh, okay. okay. So we'll start with uh, where we are in the process, just as a bit of review. Um, so the village plan review kicked off in 2020, uh, following up on the completion of the municipal plan review, which was. Was a six year process uh, and covered basically all areas outside of the village boundary. Following up on that work, Council uh, directed us to do the uh, review of the village, which has its own secondary uh, set of planning documents. There were three rounds of public engagement uh, done between 2020 and 2023, uh, and then this latest draft has now also gone to the Village Planning Advisory Committee, and we are in the orange box here, so the final public engagement in 2024. Um, as we move beyond this, uh, basically the documents will be brought back to Council uh, along with all the feedback and comments that we've gathered from these sessions. Council will have the option to make further changes or they can give the documents first reading. And uh, once they give them first reading, we set a date for a public hearing um, and then uh, go through the approval process. Uh, just a quick bit of background as to how we got here. Uh, so again, we began in 2020. 
the intent was to update the uh, current village document, which was uh, drafted in 2004. So it's been quite a while. There's a number of new and emerging issues that have arose since that time uh, that just weren't addressed in the language in the document. Um, and then uh, as well, uh, again, the, the intent here was not to uh, take away everything that was there, but look at what things were existing and we liked, but maybe could be tweaked to, uh, to work a little bit better. In terms of what informed the plan, like I mentioned earlier, there were two rounds of public engagement uh, done in 2015. Uh, this was high-level visioning focused on uh, goals and objectives. Um, I think there were some specific uh, sessions like this, but done around particular topics like the environment, built form, that type of thing. And then in 2020, uh, when we moved back into the village plan review, we uh, began discussions with the village planning advisory committee, uh, reviewed the existing plan with them, uh, looked for what things should come out, what should change, what should stay the same. Um, and then uh, essentially from that point is when the, the true public engagement began. Uh, so in 2020, we were obviously a little bit limited by the pandemic, uh, but we did a few pop-up events at Picnic in the Park and uh, at one of the Playhouse events uh, on Pleasant Street. Uh, in 2021, again, still limited in being able to do sessions such as this, um, we sent a, uh, a survey to every household in the village, covered a variety of topics that had informed the, the document you see before you, and we got a 33% response rate, which was excellent. So we had several hundred uh, return surveys. Uh, more recently, uh, in 2022, we hired a consultant, uh, FBM, Colin Baldwin and Mitchell. They're an architecture and planning firm out of Halifax. Uh, they conducted a built form and character defining elements study and held some public engagement, including uh, a, uh, an in-person session on May 18th. Uh, and they, uh, from that, uh, provided us with a report that informed uh, much of our architectural controls that you'll see in the draft here. Uh, staff also held a, uh, a workshop in August of 2022 that was focused around the Highway 3 area specifically. Um, you know, we proposed a few different scenarios for some of the new zoning uh, and got feedback on which, uh, which preferences people had and that again informed uh, the zoning that you'll see uh, in this draft. Um, then in uh, July of 2023, we published draft one. We had four meetings uh, in this room over July and August, uh, similar to this session. Um, then following those sessions, we did lots of uh, phone calls, written submission and in-person discussions. Uh, some folks came to council directly to speak to their uh, issues, the things that they wanted to see changed from draft one to draft two. Uh, and then in October, uh, I brought back uh, what I call the What We Heard report. So that summarized all of the feedback and included all of the written, original written submissions as well. Uh, that went back to council and we reviewed that with them, which resulted in a series of changes, which brings us to uh, draft two that we have uh, to share today. So just as a quick overview, so when we talk about the village planning documents, there, there's two documents that we need. Uh, this is the secondary planning strategy, that's the policy document of council, it sets out goals and objectives, um, and those uh, you know, sort of higher level uh, initiatives. And then the land use bylaw is the companion document, and that's the regulatory piece that uh, implements the rules that carry out the policies that the, the secondary plan uh, speaks to. So just briefly to talk about the secondary plan, uh, like I said, uh, it has uh, several sections on vision, goals, and sort of the purpose. So the overall intent here was to uh, keep the existing village character, the look and feel. Um, and as we get into talking about a lot of the architectural and other types of uh, uh, land use and lot coverage provisions, those are all around trying to keep the look and feel uh, of the village uh, as it is today. Um, this slide shows a number of, or not a number of, all of the, uh, the zones. So on the left you have the, the current zones, and on the right you have the, the new names for the zones. For the most part, many of them have stayed the same. Uh, the biggest change would be in the residential zones, uh, where uh, we moved from having sort of uniquely named zones um, that were um, descriptive, but not always necessarily a great, uh, a great match. Um, and we've just gone to an R1 to R4 zone, which is standard and something you find in many other land use bylaws. Um, this is the zoning map, so it's the same map that's on the table in the back there. Um, again, uh, if you compare this to a zoning map from today, you see overall uh, fairly close similarities. There's not a huge amount of change. Uh, there's a few areas, and I have a slide later that talks about some of the uh, some of the areas that have changed in terms of zoning. 
And uh, yeah, so now moving into the land use bylaw, just a couple of uh, a couple of notes, uh, and some of these will get us back into probably the short-term rental discussion. Um, so accessory structures are essentially anything other than the main building on the lot. So if we're talking about a residential lot, your house is the main building, an accessory structure would be a garage or a shed or anything like that. Uh, so these are you know, regulations for those structures. They have to be set back from property lines. Uh, they aren't to be located in the front yard of a lot. Um, they do uh, need to adhere to the lot coverage limits, which we'll talk about in, uh, in a few slides. Um, next would be accessory dwelling units. So this is the piece I was mentioning earlier. Uh, so this is a new, uh, a new use in this plan. Uh, this 2004, this term didn't really exist. Um, so essentially, uh, as, as I mentioned, they're permitted uh, one per lot in all residential zones. Uh, the units are limited to 100 meters squared, which is about 1,000 square feet, um, so sort of a modest apartment size. Um, you need to prove that you can provide an additional on-site parking space for the, the folks who would be living there. Um, and if, and again, as I, as I mentioned, the unit could either be in the main building, either as a basement apartment or an attic, uh, you know, any, sort of, any sort of unit in the main building, uh, or it could be a standalone uh, small building in, in, the, in the backyard. Um, so if it's in the main building, the main uh, entrance for that second unit um, can't be on, basically on the front of the building. And the, the thinking there is we're trying to keep it looking like a single unit uh, dwelling when you view it from the street. So options would be to either have the, the front entrance, or the entrance for the, um, for the accessory dwelling unit on the side or the rear, or it could be through a common vestibule in the front where you go in one door and then split off into the uh, units that way. So again, this I think is an example of how we're trying to maintain the look and feel while updating the plan uh, in, in terms of the types of uses that just weren't, uh, weren't possible, or uh, weren't not possible, but weren't, uh, didn't, didn't really exist in, in uh, 2004. Like I said, currently um, those lots have that residential conversion, so they could just be split into two units. It could look exactly, sorry, oh, sorry. Oh, I, I had a question, sorry. No. Um, okay, so architectural controls. Um, the first piece uh, to cover here is around the height limit. Um, so we've made uh, some changes to to the height limit and the way that works. Not not drastically. Currently, the height limit would range from eight to ten meters. Now, as you'll see on the table on the right here, it ranges from eight to eleven meters. So it has increased a little bit for that top category. Basically, the way this works is. Uh, depending on your roof pitch, that will determine the, uh, the maximum height of your structure. And what we mean by roof pitch, to keep things simple, because there can be things like doorbells that have different pitches than the mini roof pitch. Basically, we're looking at the total roof area, and if more than 50% of that meets this threshold, then you would be within one of those um, categories. So essentially what this does is it, uh, it is a bonus or an incentive for more steeply pitched roofs, which is something that both yeah, the M study identified, as well as uh, lots of comments that we've heard in the past uh, from village residents, which is that uh, sort of the 412 pitch, which currently is what's used as considered a steeply pitched roof, um, really isn't steep, and that's not really the traditional Chester roof. So we've tweaked uh, that table and those, um, those pitches to reflect that. The other piece that's uh, changed when we're talking about height is the way we measure height. So currently, we measure from the very top of the roof to the lowest point where the foundation meets grade or meets the dirt, basically. Um, the change that we've made is uh, essentially for construction on hills, basically, which we have lots of those. So we're still going to start at the top to measure height, but at the bottom, rather than going to the very lowest point, so if you picture a house that's built on a hill, um, you know, on, on one side, the dirt's going to meet the concrete here, on the other side, it's going to be down there. We'll take the middle, the middle point of that, the thinking is it doesn't penalize folks as much for building into a hill, and the hope is that that will prevent people from, before they come in for permits, terracing the lot, like cutting it out and making it flat, cut up the hillside, and then build up that way. Um, so we, that's, that's the hope there, is that that will, will help disincentivize terracing and, and encourage people to sort of work with the, with the terrain. Um, when we're talking about those architectural controls, uh, we are basically talking about all the properties within the green area. 
So properties that are outside of the green area, um, there are a very small number of architectural controls, but those roof pitch provisions do not apply. Um, so I just want to be clear that we're basically, when we're talking about architectural controls, we're talking about the area in green. Um, and that's similar to the current um, inner architectural control area, is what it's called under the, under the current plan. Um, there are some additional, in addition to the height and the pitch, um, there are some more architectural provisions. So again, this is within that, within that green area that we looked at. Um, so buildings that are larger than 140 meters square in footprint, which is about 1,500 square feet, um, need to incorporate what we call buried massing. That basically means that the design of the building needs to be broken up with some sort of architectural elements. It could be a porch or different wings of the building or, or other kind of architectural features. So basically it can't just be one big blank box or blank wall. That exists today and uh, staff and also the FBM report felt that that was working well, so we just carried that forward. We are uh, proposing a new uh, limit to the window area for each, and this is on sort of a per side or a per wall basis. Uh, so what, what this says here uh, is by, by default, you can go up to 60% of the total wall area could be covered with windows. And in some cases you could go up, excuse me, to 80% in order to get from the 60 to the 80%, basically, you have to show that the windows are um, broken up, and basically broken up into panes um, with, with mullions and dividers. And again, that's to reflect that traditional window look. What this is specifically trying to prevent is uh, the very new modern uh, type of construction where you may have metal or wood framing around the outside and then a fold glass wall. Um, and that, although it may be you know, a nice style of building is not something that traditionally fits in with Chester Village, so that, uh, that's a new, uh, new addition there. Um, we also uh, currently have a prohibition on uh, metal siding. Um, there's been some discussion about should metal siding be allowed if it closely resembles a traditional shape or, or other kind of material. Um, so that would certainly, along with everything else, be something we'd be interested to hear, uh, hear from folks on. Um, and then finally, uh, there are also some new uh, regulations for attached garages. Basically, it has to do with the width of the garage in relation to the width of the home, um, and also that the garage door has to be set back from the main entrance of the home so that the garage isn't pushed out into the street, um, like you sometimes see in suburban areas where the garage really dominates and the house is kind of an afterthought. That's not, that's not what we think is the Chester look. Um, so, yeah, so lot coverage. This was something that uh, garnered, I think, a good bit of interest, and, and rightly so. Um, I, I apologize that this may seem a little bit confusing. It's not meant to be, and I'd be happy to, <laughs> to explain it. But So first, we're talking about the residential one zone. So this is what's currently called the estate residential zones to the peninsular areas, basically, for the most part. Um, there, I guess I should, I should mention, I do have a slide on this, but this was the zone that we had proposed to reduce the minimum lot size significantly from the 40,000 square feet to 10,000. That has been reversed, so the minimum lot size of the zone is back to 40,000 square feet. Just, just for clarity, yes, because I think that's important for talking about lot coverage here. So, um, in this zone, there is now a uh, maximum footprint for new structures. So that's how big it is at the ground floor, and that is, Basically, as you see here, 350 meters squared. I'm just going to refer to my chart here, which is about 3,750 square feet. So it's a large, it's a it's a large footprint, but we have large homes in that zone, and that's reflective of that. Um, coupled with that, there is also a maximum gross floor area. So that's essentially, you know, if you put a, an exact second story on top of it, you get your 700 meters squared, which is about 7,500 square feet. So that's a it's very very large uh, very large building. Um, those numbers again came out of the FBM study. They looked at the footprints of the existing buildings in that zone, um, and this was, I guess you might say, in the sweet spot. Most of them fit within this, and the very large, built, the buildings that look very large in that zone may have been beyond this, meaning that those wouldn't be able to be built going forward on a, on a vacant lot. The other piece uh, in the R1 zone is the lot coverage, and so this is essentially. Uh, includes your main building and then any accessory structures, so your garage, uh, those kind of things. And the maximum coverage you can have is up to 25% of the total lot area. So 
it depends, you know, what your lot area is, but it's it's 25% of that. And again, that came out of the FBM work. They looked at the existing footprints and the existing lot sizes and found, you know, on average that that seems to be roughly what appeared to be the character for that um, for that zone. There is one exception to this uh, in terms of the lot coverage, and that is something called small accessory structures. They are defined in the bylaw, so a small accessory structure has a definition. And by definition, it is 215 square feet or less. So it's a, it's a, it's a 10 by 20, so it's a pretty small storage shed. Um, and so in the R1 zone, um, you get your 25% lot coverage. And if that is maxed out, you are still able to do two of these small accessory structures. The thinking there is that on existing lots, or if somebody say you purchased a lot that was fully built out and you didn't have Place to keep the lot or, or a small storage shed. Um, that's that's what that's intended to allow. It's limited in number. Um, the reason that it's two in that zone, you'll see in a moment, it's not two in every zone, is because of the reflective of those larger larger lot sizes. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So the lot coverage is everything except for small accessory structures, which are defined as being 215 square feet or smaller. Yeah. What is the reasoning behind the maximum lot coverage? Which um, yeah, so that's it. so again, it's part of the character, uh, part of the character piece, and again, that was they, they looked at the existing coverage just to kind of, and that was, I would say, like on average, 25% would have been roughly what you'd find if you went out there and calculated that today. And so, if somebody without those lot coverages, if somebody came in and built buildings all over the place that met, that would presumably be. You know, be something that people would think was not in keeping with, with, the, with the look and feel of Chester. So this was one of those ones where I think um, we, it, it, it wasn't a result of any particular development. We, it was just identified as something that we, we could fairly easily um, regulate and that if we didn't regulate it, it left the potential open that something that may not be desirable to happen. Yes? Is there anything in place to protect uh, in the village core proper? There are several at least half a dozen large sprawling lots with lovely old homes in them, but they're not in what I see as your ex-residential estate. Is there any protection for them to preserve them because they're everybody that is much a look of Chester as the peninsula? Yeah, so anything that was existing would be permitted to remain and it's permitted to be rebuilt if it were, say, destroyed by fire or, or uh, you know, significantly renovated. So all of the existing structures would, would have that protection. But there's nothing to protect them. Say the owners are getting aged and they die or they want to sell it, there's nothing to prevent a, a developer from coming in and saying, boom, this is a huge lot. I'm going to subdivide it into six or eight little lots. And uh, that, that's correct, yes. Yeah. So if, if the, zone, the zones dictate the minimum lot size, you're right. So if it was in a zone that allowed a smaller minimum lot size, then, then yes, it could be subdivided. Subject to the, okay. you know, meeting those regulations. Eric, another consideration for for lot coverage and for the twenty five percent is that it also, presuming the lot isn't the rest of the lot isn't covered with a hard surface like concrete, it allows for uh, regeneration and recharge of the aquifers as well. That's yes, thank you. That's a good point too. So yeah, if if, if it's all covered with buildings and your water is running off, then uh, yeah, thank thank you, thanks, Eric. That's a good point. Um, so keeping on with lot coverage. Switching to the residential two zone. So this is uh, the zone that currently is in basically the area around us. Uh, what people might think of as the core. It's currently called the Central Village Residential Zone. Um, and uh, similar types of provisions here, although things work a little bit differently. So you'll see on the left here, uh, this is the maximum lot coverage this time. So it's not expressed as a percentage in this zone. It's, it's expressed as, a, as a, a meter squared or feet squared. Just to give you an idea of what those numbers are, um, 200 meters squared would be about 21 or 2,150 square feet, and 300 meters squared at the top end uh, would be in the range of about 3,100 square feet. Um, so, uh, in in this zone, uh, basically, again, same the same sort of calculation is done. You take your main building plus the accessory structures, and combined, those need to match basically match those uh, those sizes there. Again, in this zone, we have the small accessory structure, although in this case, we only allowed one per lot rather than two in the larger uh, R1 lots. 
Um, so again, the thinking being if you had a property that was fully built out and kind of didn't, didn't have a place to keep your lawn equipment or your snow shovels, um, we wanted to be a bit flexible in, in, in that while still keeping to the principle of the, of the, of the overall lot coverage. Uh, so the next slides are kind of just, a, I guess, kind of an overview of, we'll go through residential, commercial, and institutional development. Um, so uh, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, the plan, we've changed the names away from the estate zone, the single unit zone, the central village zone, to R1 to R4. Um, there were a number of reasons for that. The estate zone quite early on uh, was identified by the planning advisory committee staff and some consultants that we had as being um, a bit of a, a bit of a tricky name that kind of gave a feeling of exclusivity uh, or, or and maybe and, and some may feel that that's appropriate um, but uh, but anyway um, so for, for it was pretty strong agreement to change the name of that zone and when we started to look at that zone not every zone matched really what it what it was um, and so the r1 and r4 like i said it's a standard thing that you'll find in in most land use bylaws in many municipalities. And generally what it means is R1 is your more restrictive zone, allowing less numbers of units, and R is as you move up, R4 being the, I'll say, least restrictive zone, allowing the most number of units, but there's still regulations there. Um, we've already been over this, but again, uh, I think it's, it's an important piece of the new plan is that all residential zones permit, at a minimum, uh, a single unit dwelling and the one accessory dwelling unit. Um, like I mentioned earlier, that replaces this residential conversions clause that we've got now. I think it simplifies it. I think it makes it easier for people to understand their property rights and what they can do. Um, yes? Just one question. The accessory dwelling unit now, though, as proposed, would could be a separate built unit, small unit, yes. on a lot that doesn't now have that, which again affects the recharge. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. It does still. It would still count towards the lot coverage, but yes, it, it, that that is that is the difference. So the conversion is within the existing building, and the accessory building could either be in the existing building or in, in the back there. Yes. Um, also, uh, and this is as is today, small based the small home based businesses are permitted in the residential zones. Um, so it's not retail uses, but it's things like certainly home offices, but also if you had a uh, you know, did nails or hair salon or those kind of things where you're just bringing a small number of, uh, of clients in. As uh, kind of an overview of the commercial zone, so there's two uh, commercial zones in the uh, in the new plan, uh, the highway commercial zone and the core commercial zone. Um, those both are similar to how they exist today, although there are some changes which we'll go over. So the core, excuse me, the core commercial zone um, is what you find on uh, Pleasant, Queen, Duke, and then going out Valley Road, connecting to the number three. Um, and so in that zone, there is a new provision uh, that um, at the ground floor, um, when, when new development goes in, 50% of the ground floor area and 80% of the store front has to be devoted to a commercial use. The reasoning for that is we're trying to maintain that walkable downtown where you can walk along and window shop and, and, and that you're not either having a, a residential wall or, or it works a blank wall, you know, with apartments above it or something like that. So, um, yeah, so those two work together. So if your ground floor was a thousand square feet, you know, 500 square feet would have to be commercial and you'd have to kind of load that up front so that 80% of the storefront. Well, we, the reason we said 80%, not 100% is we wanted to allow for potentially like a, you know, maybe a doorway with a stair with stairs going up to the second floor. So that could be your 20% your of, your, of your front of your building. Yes. So, in, in, in a lot of cases down in our downtown core in a commercial area, there are a lot of residential, fully residential homes. Yeah. How does that figure in? Right. Good question. So anything, again, anything that's existing is not, there's no requirement to adhere to this until or unless a change was requested. So if you went to, and it would have to be not changing it from a single unit to a single unit, it have to be, you know, adding units or adding other kinds of commercial uses. So yeah, because that's a good point. There are uh, there are a, a quite a large number of single unit residences now in that commercial zone. So if anything, what this does is allows them the option to consider, you know, Changes. different kind of uses down the road. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just before commercial zone, um, like, could there be an exclusion for multi-unit residential? And the only reason I suggest that is that uh, 
I mean, I mean you know, this, this would be unannounced to most, but I mean, we're looking for affordability, we're looking for housing units, et cetera. Um, commercial components to any kind of residential multi unit structure make it extremely difficult to finance. Uh, not from the sense that it's not possible, it's just very complicated. I, I, I just wonder if it does. Does, does having that multi-unit, uh, having that preclusion from it, uh, sort of promote the idea of building, a, let's let's just say, housing in downtown Chester? Yeah. So, uh, good good question. So, this the way this this piece applies is anything that goes to as of right would like as a like basically you come in and get a development permit would, would trigger that. Um, there is in this commercial zone there is the ability to do a residential multi-unit residential through a development agreement. Uh, about to 10 units, and that um, I think that would be where that line became negotiable. Uh, it's not a hard and fast requirement. Uh, the way it, the way it works is in, in the zone, uh, you can do up to four residential units in the same building as a commercial use. So that would require that 50 and 80. But if you want to go beyond four residential units, it pushes you into a development agreement, which again is that. Or arguably, if you wanted to do three units without the commercial, the development agreement would still satisfy that. Uh, I'd have to I'd have to confirm if it allows you to go smaller without the resident commercial. It's 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 only it's intended if you want more units, then we allow you to be purely residential. Um, whereas if you're kind of to your point about if you want that. Perhaps that would just be worth considering on, on reducing the threshold for the, the need for the commercial unit. Like I don't see 10 unit buildings in downtown Chester, but four and five would be an interesting consideration. Yeah. Jane, yeah. Take a look at the numbers. Sure. So I have a question. So if, if you were able to put a 10 unit building, it still has to meet the height restriction? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the, yeah, so the, um, sorry. Um, so yeah, so if yeah, uh, when it when it goes through DA, uh, there basically are a set of uh, policies that need to be adhered to, and that includes things like uh, height and architectural provisions. So we would yeah, we would be looking forward to. Do need parking? Um, yeah, so as part of the development agreement process, um, there is a provision that there needs to be what it says is adequate parking. So that's. Open to interpretation and negotiation back and forth, but yes, there is a part of that, that, that yeah, there be parking provided. Um, yeah, so also in the. Uh, where? So if, oh, yes. <laughs> sorry, where would that parking be? But for which property? Uh, any new one. Well, there's On a Queen Street or. Well, you're right. So, some, so, so, yeah, and that's actually that ties in here um, that. New, yeah. Um, so it, it would depend on the lot. Some, some, you know, some on Valley might have space if they're if it's not developed currently. Um, others that are fully built out wouldn't wouldn't have the ability to provide parking. So that's that's part of the right that's part of the regulations. It doesn't guarantee every lot can build everything that's written in the bylaw. You have to meet all the other provisions like parking and, and, and everything else. Yeah. Um, but to that point, uh, we also do have a, uh, an exemption uh, for, you know, and again, this might sound a little bit confusing because we just talked about a multi-unit residential building, but all of the uses in the commercial zone that are listed as, as of right, which is a large list of commercial type uses, uh, they do not require on-site parking so in forage. <coughs> exactly to your point, in, in, in acknowledgement of the fact that many of those lots are currently built out. Uh, and, and we or I feel that our current regulations, the way they work, are actually probably um, inhibiting some businesses from expanding or making better use of second floors and that kind of thing. Um, as there, in the current bylaw, there is an exemption for, again, tied to existing buildings that were the first 1,000 square feet of floor area it doesn't need parking, it's exempt, and then beyond that you do. And so my impression is that there probably are businesses out there that have limited themselves because of that and if they go further <coughs> they just can't provide the parking. Um, so the hope would be that that this kind of change would sort of spur either maybe expansion of existing businesses or maybe new businesses to come in again to get a back office or a second floor um, without tripping additional uh, on-site parking. Um, the other sort of quasi-commercial uh, zone uh, is the marine development zone. This is a change. Currently, this is called the marine industrial zone, and it really is only applied to the high-slope boat area properties under the current plan. 
um, we, we've, we've changed the zone, hence the, the change in the name, it, to really reflect more of a kind of a marine commercial zone now. Um, so the existing boatyard properties are specifically listed in the bylaw. They can continue to be basically marine industrial use, and that can continue in perpetuity. Um, but we've expanded the zone to, for example, the Roblox properties as well. Uh, and this zone uh, is, like I said, is more of a commercial zone. So industrial use could not be done on the Roblox property, only on the existing boatyard properties. But things like restaurants, marinas, uh, boat tours or boat rentals, those kind of things could be done within, within this zone. I've got serious concerns about this. Should I be waiting to the end, or when should I be no, we, we can, we can. Okay, I'll come question. up to the yeah. microphone. <laughs> okay, um, my name is Lloyd Robbins. I live at 93 Granite Street, which is just backs on to Heisler's Boatyard. I moved here in 2012, and one of the reasons I bought where I bought was because I had marine industrial use below me. I'm a boat owner and a boat lover. So it's a natural site for me. I and a number of people here today, the Marine Industrial Zone, the Heisler property, is in the middle of a residential, single family dwelling community. And the major concern that we have, no problem with Marine Industrial, but adding restaurants and tourist accommodation, it's not compatible with a single family community. If it becomes a restaurant, it will turn and tourist accommodation. The thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna become a wedding venue. And I know in Lunenburg County, there's issues in Mahone Bay and that about the noise and the disruption of having a wedding, wedding community in your backyard, which will be my backyard. Um, so I'm opposed to that, as are other people here. But in specific, you say tourist accommodation, and you said over two, we would, we would do it by development agreement. Well, there's no maximum size, so there could be 20 units on, our, on the land below us, and there's no protection against that, and our only ability to argue against it would be in the development agreement stage. But unfortunately, you have a policy, policy 22, which says the marine development zone shall permit more intensive and potentially, potentially, this is the key words, disruptive commercial uses by development agreement. I made my living helping people through development agreements, mostly from the developer side, and when I saw that word from the developer side, disruptive, it means that if I go to the UARB as a private citizen, the UARB will look at that word, if I'm saying it's not compatible with the community, they'll say, so what? The municipal planning strategy says that it can be disruptive. So I would ask you to A, exclude tourist accommodations and restaurants from the marine industrial zone. The roadblock, great location, and probably they would want, and the neighborhood around there has built around that, understanding what the use is, that the restaurant use is already there. But we're dramatically different over on the other side of the harbor. And so I would ask you to reconsider including restaurants and tourist accommodation in the Heisler Ghost Yard. It's the traditional boatyard of Chester, and you've expressed a, a deep desire to keep history going in Chester. And up until this point, that has been something that there, we always talk about marine industrial zone, the council's protecting, the council's protecting, the council's protecting. Well, unfortunately, by combining it with the roadblock, that protection is going away, which is an historic protection. And Removing that word, if, if for some reason you keep those in, removing that word disruptive from the policy. And number two, I went and looked for, well, if it's a development agreement, surely they're going to have controls in the development agreement that have got to be satisfied. All I found was the general one. And the major one that I did not find was that it has to be designed to be compatible with the neighborhood. 
It's not there. And when you're going to put a commercial use in the middle of a residential use, residential zone, A, you shouldn't do it, but B, if you do it, you need to be protecting the residential uses in the area. So this is a major concern. I would like it to be put on the parking lot, please. Thank you. And yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, duly noted, we will absolutely bring that. That's actually the first time that we've heard a preference for industrial use to commercial use. Uh, so that's that's good to know. Because typically, from a land use perspective, an industrial use would be more <coughs> disruptive uh, than, than commercial use. It's quite often. But it's, We're, it, we moved in knowing it was industrial, right. so I'm going to live with the risk. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it could change hands, and they could bring in a new industrial use, and it might not be yeah. exactly like it is today. But if that's what we're hearing, to just keep it as green industrial. Uh, that's that's a, if council agrees with that, that's a straightforward change, uh, and we could either maintain the, the zone for the roadblock or uh, or remove that too. So nope, thank you for that comment. Um, yeah, Tristan, first and yeah, so, and, and first to say love the work that you guys do. Really happy to be a part of the process. Um, I think it's just important to note, just note for, uh, uh, for the purpose of that conversation around the green industrial uses. Um, it's a pretty small area, um, and I think there's a, a, a decent group of, of reflective, but probably the majority of, of, the, of the people that live in that neighborhood sitting uh, in the audience here tonight. I just want to have that reflected with, uh, with planning and with, uh, with the council, um, that, that, that this, is a, this is a neighborhood thing that I believe is, uh, uh, Lloyd's words are fully supported by uh, the vast majority of that neighborhood. Keep it industrial, got it. Yeah, thanks. Oh, yes. I support Lloyd's opinion. I live up the street, but I used to live uh, right down there uh, next to the high school yard, and I support Lloyd's opinion. But my question, and this might be outside your jurisdiction, has there been any consideration given to uh, the potential uh, for float houses or people using boats as permanent residences? We've definitely given it a lot of thought. Um, thankfully, it hasn't been something we've been faced with in a, in a major way yet. Um, there are some jurisdictional issues there. Uh, typically, our authority uh, ends at the high water mark uh, or anything that is connected above the high water mark. Um, so, if somebody is moored off of a mooring with a floating cottage, uh, that is outside of municipal uh, jurisdiction. The Home Bay has had a few uh, that show up every summer, and uh, it's, a, it's a similar issue there. Yeah. It'll happen sooner or later. Yeah, so that is, uh, I would believe, a provincial uh, provincial jurisdiction issue uh, at the moment, unless there were changes in the municipal government act to allow us to regulate those uses. Yeah, but definitely something we've thought of for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, so just uh, quickly here, um, just to sort of cover a uh, high level on the institutional zone. Um, so. Fairly similar to how things are today. Um, a few changes, one of which is to include uh, the golf course and the yacht club. They both fall under uh, something in the institutional zone called fraternal clubs and organizations. Uh, the golf course in particular, because this did get a few questions, uh, that doesn't mean that a new golf course could go on any institutional zone lot. Uh, it is, again, as we have proposed to do with the uh, with the industrial use, we've specifically labeled properties where the golf course exists, and, and that would be the only place it would be able to exist. Uh, the other change uh, to the institutional zone uh, is that originally, a draft one that came up last year, uh, there was a proposal to allow the only kind of residential use that was proposed in the in, in the institutional zone was um, basically affordable housing projects that were owned by either a, uh, another level of government or a not-for-profit uh, type of ownership structure. We, through our legal review, uh, it was determined that that is not something we, we can't dictate the ownership structure, basically, so we, we couldn't only limit it to that. It would have to be open to any residential development of private nature, and that was not what we were looking to do, so with that in mind, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be pulled out, um, so it will be no, no residential uses in the institutional zone. Um, now we'll get into some of the changes from draft one, and a few of these have already come up. Uh, so the first one is the R1 zone. Oh, yeah. Just a quick question. Where does Shoreham Village and our health center fit in the zone? Is it on the Highway 3? Yeah, they're in the institutional zone currently. Yeah, that's right. So that would facilitate, you know, redevelopment of Shoreham, for example. Uh, the other, I guess, change in terms of institutional is the, the old Windjammer property. We've 
presume, presume that as institutional in anticipation as being the home for the new fire hall, which we expect to happen in the next few years. And when the old fire hall moves, what will happen? Is that institutional now? Uh, it is, is, yeah. What exactly happens with the building and the property is, is yet to be determined. Uh, I think that will involve a discussion with the municipal council. The land itself, I, as far as I understand, is owned by the village commission. Um, and there may be some sort of agreement with the council on not. Um, when Taylor comes back, she might know a little bit more about the that. The municipality owns the land. Yeah. All but not the, the all Not according to the property online. But anyway, I don't want to get into it. I can, I can pull it up. But um, yeah. Uh, and that's where I say there may be some sort of agreement. It, kind of, it shows in the land registry as being the village, but there may, I think there is an agreement about it coming back to the municipality. Um, so all those discussions will be, will be coming. Uh, I would say probably the first thing will be to confirm that the new fire hall is going out there, but once that's done, then it'll be okay, what happens with the, with the building. Um, so yeah, so just going through a few more changes. Um, yeah, so short-term rentals, this is something that, that came up and we haven't really dug into it yet. So uh, initially, again, in the draft that was proposed last year, uh, there were a series of regulations proposed for short-term rentals, which currently are really not regulated in the bylaw. They didn't really exist in 2004 in the way that they do now with Airbnb other platforms. Um, so uh, this generated a lot of discussion uh, last year and, and throughout uh, the engagement period. Uh, I think the key piece uh, that, uh, that got a lot of pushback was uh, initially in the draft what, what was proposed was that anywhere that short-term rentals were taking place in a residential zone, you needed to prove that you were the primary resident of that property. So essentially what that meant was that seasonal properties would not be able to be used as short-term rentals, um, and you would have to provide proof to the development officer that that was your primary residence in order to get a permit to operate a short-term rental. Um, that was initially well received, and then we started to hear from operators and from other residents who, uh, who had concerns with that, and um, uh, you know the long history of rentals in Chester, long before Airbnb was a thing, um, and the whole digitization of it has maybe brought it to the forefront, but that, that use has, I guess, existed here for, for a long time. And so those were some of the, the stories and the cases that we started to hear. So as a result of that, uh, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, when we brought this back to council before we came up to the public sessions, uh, council gave us direction. Uh, so basically, we will be removing virtually all the regulations under the land use bylaw around short-term rentals. Uh, and there will be a new standalone bylaw, uh, a licensing bylaw created to, uh, to deal with short-term rentals. That will not be done at the same time as this plan review, and uh, that may not be myself authoring that, so I can't really speak to what's going to be in that. But it does give the ability to be much more uh, fine-grained in the approach, particularly on the enforcement side. Um, so from the land use bylaw, we were kind of stuck with, okay, if you're in a residential zone, here's the set of rules, here's how it works. Um, with the licensing bylaw, we can have uh, regulations or stipulations around, you know, if there are validated complaints, you get a certain number of complaints, maybe you don't get your license for a year, or there's financial penalties or other things that. Those kind of bylaws are much more um, nimble and flexible in, in how they can be drafted to address, I guess, what I would call problem rentals, as opposed to just blanketing everybody with the same same brush. So uh, that was the discussion from council. The, the, the couple of things that I think I, I think would be important to keep potentially in the land use bylaw would be to ensure that the accessory dwelling units that we talked about, um, it, it has always been my intent that those should not be made available as short-term rentals. Um, if they are, that's probably pretty much solely why people will build them. If they're not, then they'll, like, what we would prefer is that they be used as a long-term rental or a family member or something like that to provide a uh, housing option. Doesn't making that rule kind of go against the original idea of you need to be the permanent, you need to be the long-term, or that needs to be your primary residence in order to rent out property, but then that was flipped and now you don't have to be, that doesn't have to be your primary residence. But if you do have some space on your lot to make a little extra income, now you're saying you can't do that, even though that was the original plan. Yeah, uh, so that's, that's, that's a fair point. Well, yep. but you always had the accessory bonus not being short term. Yes, that's true. Yeah, they, they were always deemed or proposed. Yeah, but we're dealing with a new situation that I know that Chester has a history of having these rentals, but um, we have a major housing issue. 
and that, that, that would be to be part of the solution. And, and that's exactly why we would stop them from being used as a short-term rental to provide more long-term options. Okay, yeah, fair enough, yeah. fair enough. Okay, well then was the discussion in in going back on changing the rules around having to be the primary resident, was the discussion about housing um, brought up? I mean, that doesn't seem to be the point in this decision. Yeah, um, I you'd want to speak to council about that. I wouldn't want to speak for them. Um, I think primarily that discussion was around the junior sailing club is going to fail if they don't have a place to stay and, and those kinds of stories. That's, that's what was presented to council. So, so Carl, basically, I think you said the other night, if we had concerns about the short-term rental, you go to council and present your concerns. Is that right? Yeah, I think that would be basically because this bylaw is yet to be drafted. So it's, there, it's, it's a blank slate at this point. So if you had something that you thought should be addressed or, or shouldn't be addressed, um, that would, yeah, that would, like, and the only reason I said it is because we, it hasn't been assigned to a particular staff person, so I can't give you a particular phone number because they call, you know, so-and-so and talk to them about, about this. Um, so at this point, probably going to council uh, would be the, the best bet or waiting until, like, there will be engagement done, I'm sure, when that bylaw is drafted before, you know, it's not going to be just dropped on, on, uh, on everyone, so. Um, yeah, if you wanted to speak to it now, I'd say probably go to council or, or kind of keep, stay tuned for when, when there is specific engagement on that piece. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so still in our, oh, yes. Uh, uh, just in, in response, as we, we, as a group, we met in council and talked about the, the Airbnb matter. Um, I'd say one, you know, one comment that kind of that came to mind uh, here that it's going to be going to be going going to be going to council uh, uh, for a, a licensing. I, I guess I mean, the message from the room might be that uh, we, we we might want to hear from council sooner rather than later as to the expedience that that's going to be done. Um, just where where I, I mean I was left with the idea that that, that could be some time before that licensing yeah. uh, comes up uh, to abate the concerns of, of people in the room. But, but to another point is the group that we came in with is in answer to your to your point. Um, we, you know, our group that approached it to say that we were, you know, we were somewhat opposed to uh, to the regulations that were going in place. And I'm not an Airbnb operator in, in, in Chester, so I, it, it was more from an economic perspective and from a common sense perspective of the vast majority of properties in this village that are rented short term, aside from the historical economy, are. are they're not affordable houses. They're not. They're not. They're not readily affordable for purchase or rent um, by the people that own them. Um, however, the, the the proposed before the change was made, the proposal was that those properties be relegated to the commercial uh, zoning within the village, and the commercial zoning within the village was the only place where you could foreseeably build multi-unit residential, which is the housing that we would outside of excessive units. The the the, uh, the the multi the, the the affordable housing or availability of housing in the village. So it was sort of a counterintuitive uh, uh, plan to create housing by by eliminating short term rentals, creating the need to create uh, short term rentals in the only area where you could build long term rentals. Um, so I think that was something that, that we approached as a group, and I just wanted to make that point. But I think that was greatly considered, uh, not just by staff but by council when when that group approached to say that. I think it's a more holistic plan in its approach, um, a, a more long-term plan on, on the idea of removing multi-million dollar properties from short-term rental in some way to force them into the only place you can actually build affordable housing. I hear this argument a lot that um, these aren't affordable houses, but it seems like through allowing the short-term rentals, um, that's providing an excuse to keep them as one family dwellings or single person dwellings in some cases whereas if people weren't able to do that then maybe they would reconsider how those buildings are being used i, I think it would um, take a tremendous effect of the market to reduce multi-million dollar waterfront properties to affordable to the fact that to go below 1800 dollars a month in rent um i guess so maybe maybe we don't have to go to the opposite extreme but maybe somewhat and then also we're talking about developing or trying to keep this commercial area but who's patronizing these businesses if nobody's living here all year well that, no the commercial area was not yeah, i think we should probably yeah. Yeah. come up yeah. 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 maybe not for me you can connect the economy yeah. 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 No, seriously good 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 points on both sides um okay yeah so just uh, quickly here to finish up with the changes um so 
the corner vision triangle, for those of you that were around last summer, was uh, an initiative that we were proposing, something you find in a lot of municipalities. The key difference between us and those municipalities are those are municipalities that own their streets, and we do not. Uh, they are provincially owned here in Chester. So the intent around this was going to be a requirement to make property owners keep the red triangles around intersections clear from vegetation beyond a certain height to improve sight lines. And well intended, uh, but unfortunately it just is a jurisdictional issue that we can't overcome, having our municipal staff trying to undertake provincial responsibilities and working within provincial right of ways just is not is not possible. So that's unfortunate, but that is something you had to had to pull out. It is still a provincial mandate, so I would encourage you to reach out to your MLA if you have concerns in that area. And my understanding is that when the province does come through, they come through and do it all in one go. So maybe if they hear enough, they'll you know get Chester this summer kind of thing. Do it. Do it. Yeah. Um, the other piece here, unrelated to the corner vision, uh, initially we had proposed a height exemption for on building solar panels uh, up to two meters. So basically, if your height limit was 10 meters, the solar panels could go two meters beyond that in order to be oriented and positioned in that airflow. Uh, we heard pretty strongly that that would potentially create a, an aesthetic concern uh, with all this metal stuff up above the roof lines. So we essentially removed that. So on building solar is still permitted. It just has to conform with the height of the, uh, the main roof. So what that might mean is if you had a roof that was right to the max, you may not be able to put panels right there. You might have to you know, use different portions of the roof for your, for your solar panels. Um, we have a new, uh, a new provision here now, so retaining walls that are two meters or greater in height, so that's about six and a half feet, um, now will require a development permit and also a geotechnical uh, report to go along with them to make sure that they're not going to create any unstable slopes or concerns with, uh, with uh, slumping or, or issues like that. Um, there was a recent <coughs> uh, request to council to uh, allow shipping containers, uh, if they were fully clad in, in what would be our architectural controls for siding materials, roofing materials, and doors. Um, that was uh, that was agreed to by council, so we put that in, and along, it came as part of a proposal, basically as part of a containerized agriculture um, development that somebody is looking at, so basically these containers come from the US pre, pre ready to grow stuff and you drop them in place and then it's like a hydroponic farm that operates in the uh, in the container. But it is a shipping container. We researched it and, and they, they are they look a little bit different than the standard you know uh, industrial shipping containers, but, but they still are. So uh, this was the compromise that we found uh, and that council agreed to. Um, so this would take you know significant effort uh, to to clad it and it, there also is provisions in there um, it technically is not needed, but we've even got a line in there to say like the cladding has to stay on. So if it starts to fall off, we're going to be after you to get it back up and keep it keep it looking looking good. Um, along with that, uh, basically, uh, the, there is a, a new use uh, called a commercial agriculture use that's permitted by development agreement in the outer areas. So if you remember the green and brown with the architectural, it's in the brown, so outside the, the core of the village here. Um, and uh, so that is permitted by development agreement. So basically, um, commercial agriculture includes a variety of things, but it would include if somebody was lucky to keep farm animals other than the six chickens that everybody is allowed to have under the bylaw. So if you wanted horses or cows or, or more chickens, uh, that, would, that would require development agreement. Question? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the shipping container thing, I'd like you to expand a bit more on that. Personally, I'm opposed to allowing shipping containers in the village. Uh, I think that, um, you know, for the last 30 years, we've banned shipping containers in the village. And I think the an analogy that you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. So I would think, I'd like to see that put in the parking lot that that council reconsider that decision of allowing that. Now, I know there's a potential business. It may or may not happen, but I think throwing the rest of the community under the bus to allow for one shipping container outside of, well, it's not outside the village boundary, but it's outside area, what we used to call the outside village area. I, I don't think that's good planning. If you want to protect the integrity of the village, to have it have a container with a flat roof because there's no mention of any pitch or anything on that roof. I think 
is not the direction to go in. So yeah, um, agreed. Chad, you want to jump right down there? Um, yeah, so uh, fair, fair comment. Uh, just just to clarify, shipping containers are allowed in the village in a very select few places out of lot number two currently. They have to be turned a certain way to the road. They have to have a fence around them. They can't have like decals or other sorts of like numbers and letters. And that kind of stuff. But it's, it's very limited. It's only a couple of properties that really qualify for that. Was our towns, but uh, like to allow them up and down Queen Street and stuff. Yeah. So, so, there, so there's, a, I think there's, a, there's a few options here. Like with, 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 if we were, if council does agree that there are changes, made, there's a few options. One would be just only allow them in that outer area, even if they are dressed up. Um, another would be to outright prohibit them, regardless. Um, and the third, which would prohibit them, but it may be, uh, we, there's always, there's often been this discussion around shipping containers or even mobile homes that. Even if you can't have a shipping container, you could still build an eight foot by 20 foot, you know, building out of wood and that would be allowed here. So something that we do not have in the architectural provisions that we could definitely look at if we hear that it's a strong and council's in favor uh, would be like a, uh, a building width ratio, so a width to length ratio, so that it would prevent. Easy. So I think we would want to couple that with not permitting shipping containers. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. But if that's the route we go, we could also look to a ratio so that somebody couldn't build that wooden building that looks exactly the same. And then I think we would be on a, you know, taking a, taking a, a path, you know, taking a, a route as opposed to piece dealing, piece dealing is one thing because it's a container that's covered in shingles and another thing that was built with wood and it's covered in shingles. But uh, at the meeting the other day, there was also a discussion that you could put vinyl siding on three sides of it and, and a wood, wood on one side. Not quite. So that was for small. That was for houses that were under fifteen hundred square feet. Uh, that wasn't on the ship. Not on the ship. No. no. Yeah. So yeah. But uh, but yeah. So that's we will we'll bring that back. Um, we, we did hear that on Tuesday as well. But there was a strong opposition to shipping containers across the board. Um, and uh, yeah. Just out of curiosity, on Brad's point of the final siding on three sides of the building at fifteen hundred square feet. Yeah. Is there a differentiation between that being allowed within the architectural control zone of the village and or the outer that outer area, or is that is that is that throughout the uh, throughout both zones? That's so that uh, that is within the architectural area, not in the outer area. And just for everybody else's sake, what what that is is uh, there is a, well actually we're gonna get there in just a second. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, not that far. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Um, so uh, the next change is so there is in, in the draft, it was in draft one last year, there is a stormwater standard. And what this is is essentially, in layman's terms, what we're looking for is for the developer uh, to prove that the runoff from a property after development is the same that it was before development. Um, that's that's the standard we use. Peak and post flow is the, sort of the terminology. Um, so the standard itself hasn't changed. That's been in there, written as is. Um, what we have changed is we've essentially lowered the threshold for what triggers that standard. So uh, going forward, uh, if you're building a one or a two unit home, you do not trigger that requirement. But if you're building a three unit building or greater or any sort of commercial or industrial building, you would be required to uh, prove that you're meeting that standard. So you're not going to inundate your neighbors with runoff water as a result of the development you're doing. Um, along with that, we have added, that's the full arrow at the bottom, and I know it's probably too small to read, um, a small exemption. So if you had an existing commercial business and you were doing an addition that was under 20 meters squared, which is about 215 square feet, you would not be required to provide that. The thinking there would be like if somebody was doing a new set of stairs or a new small deck, that's unlikely to greatly change the uh, the, the, you know, the flow of water. Um, and, and we don't, we're, we're always trying to find a balance with all of these things. And in that case, we're trying to find a balance between for being reasonable for folks that are existing, but in cases that new development is going in, um, again, lower, lowering that standard. So before it was applied to larger multi-unit buildings and larger commercial uses. So um, yeah, that's the change there. And then this is what we were just talking about in terms of um, architectural control. So the second bullet point here is the one we'll, uh, we'll hone in on. Um, so uh, 
currently, as, as proposed, uh, the vinyl siding is, is to be prohibited on structures that are larger than 1,500 square feet in footprint. So on your larger homes, vinyl would be outright prohibited. As it stands today, and this, is, this particular piece has generated quite a bit of discussion, uh, vinyl siding would be permitted on buildings with a smaller footprint. And the way this works, and this can be a little counterintuitive the way it's worded here. So what it says is 25% of the public facade, which is basically the wall or the walls of the building that face the, the public street, uh, limited 25% of vinyl. What that means is that the other walls that are not facing the street can be fully clad in vinyl as it's written today. Uh, this has got a lot of uh, a lot of pushback, and we've heard a variety of things from just ban it outright, no, no vinyl at all. We've also heard a strong push that if a material like vinyl or metal can look like a traditional material, that it should be allowed. Um, so again, there's no final decision here, so we're, we're definitely open to, I think I saw maybe a hand, I'm not sure. Yeah, the hand was simply, why ban it? Because the product is getting better and better, and it may be a more, um, a better environmental solution than some of the other solutions. We have to balance these things, but why just ban it? Well, and that's it. It's, it's, so it's, it's a right now it's banned on the larger buildings. The thinking there being that if you're able to afford a larger building, you likely can afford a higher quality of material, um, and and then that's why it's limited here. Um, but again, we've heard we've heard from both sides to to completely allow it, to completely ban it. Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think your wording could be cleaned up. Like vinyl siding, everybody thinks ugly vinyl siding, but there are some new products yeah, that come out. That, you know, so if you cleaned up your wording, it might be a bit more acceptable, <laughs> but not to me. <laughs> <laughs> and if you were going to go down that route of allowing certain kinds, we have to have a very specific language to try to help the development officers make a determination is does it look like, is it a close enough resemblance to a cedar shake? So that's where you're right, and I think that's going to be tricky language to get perfect. Just in the I just think on fit, like on 140 meters square, 1500 square feet, probably. If, if, if that was if that was overall square footage of the entire structure, that that might be you know maybe a, a, a two 750 square foot floors, but you know that could be a substantial structure completely clad by the side. I think that's a little bit loose in that regard. In, in, in what you know what's what's being said in the sense, it really is a detraction from the architectural vernacular of the village. Uh, yes. So. 1,500 square foot building with new height limitations with the right pitch. I can have three stories of vinyl siding on a pretty large building yeah. anywhere inside the village. And I think that I just think it needs to be honed in a little bit. I, I think, you know, to further what Tristan's saying, there are a lot of um, people who want to make a lot of money out of a large building or a large house. So they don't really care about what it looks like. And putting vinyl siding also may lead them to not putting their character that they may still not maintain that vinyl siding which can blow off in a windstorm, gets just as dirty and moldy as paint does, etc. etc. But they feel that they don't have to do anything because of vinyl. Um, but my next question was um, I noticed there are commercial and multi units subject to height and roof pitch provisions. What about cladding? Um, yes, yeah, so the, the cladding would apply to them. So well. they cannot use vinyl siding either. Right? It would be, as it is currently, it would go by the size. Uh, so if there was a small commercial building, they, they could, could take advantage of the third bullet there. But um, Because the commercial core and the village core is a major part of how this village feels and presents to tourists, to filmmakers, to a lot of people. Yeah. You know, so there were filmmakers, but our, our character of our village brings a lot of work to the village. So we have to be very careful what's going on the way. Okay, so I think, yeah, we've got some good feedback, and I think generally I'm sensing a reluctance to buy all or at the very <laughs> least, a significant reduction in the world's use. So, um, okay, uh, some other uh, architectural controls. So some of these are the things we kind of touched on earlier, so this is really just building upon them. So I mentioned earlier, metal siding was prohibited. We've added, prohibited. We've added to that list, so at this meeting will include vinyl, if that's where that discussion goes. <laughs> uh, but as it stands now, uh, metal siding, concrete block, unfinished concrete, and stone veneer or folk, folk stone uh, is also permitted, uh, prohibited, I'm sorry. There is an exception uh, for 
and, and again, we've, we've heard suggestions that in all cases we should allow a lookalike, but in the case where the building code requires a non-combustible material, as it's written today, we would accept a metal uh, or a concrete uh, shake or, or something that's done in a traditional uh, look when it's required for fire, uh, basically for fire safety. Um, in addition, uh, we've, there's, uh, there's a, a height limit of six meters proposed for accessory structures. This is in the current plan that's just been brought forward. Um, and uh, recently there's been a discussion about um, a pinch provision for accessory structures. So currently that's uh, not, there, there is not a, a requirement that accessory structures have a pitched roof, um, but that was raised as well as something that should be considered. I think that's, I think that's valid given the other pitch uh, regulations that we've got proposed here. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, so large accessory structures, were basically anything over 20 meters squared, has to comply with the architectural provisions, so that would be your siding uh, and window proportions and those kind of things. Uh, we've added a new provision to clarify that basically all lots require some amount of softscaping or lawn area and that stone or gravel or other kind of aggregate material is not an acceptable replacement. So in, you might have seen in arid environments sometimes people will replace their front yard with stone and, and there can be reasons that that makes a lot of sense and in certain environments I think that can be totally acceptable but it's definitely not something we're used to here in Chester I think it would stand out. Um, so that came through the as well. And I have the gravel on, and I'll tell you why. It's environmental. If we have water, and I can water it, I've got a south facing area, I'm right down on the parade. And I can put some evergreens in it, make it look a lot less gravelly, which is plan A. But I think from an environmental and water point of view, that's ridiculous. We're you know, we're in a dry world. If you want to supply me with the water. Not the water that long. You know, I've replaced it. I've replaced it twice. I think this is just nuts. We've got to we got to work with the environment as it is changing. So telling people they got to have a lawn. Lawns are ridiculous. Water hogs, you know, chemical hogs, and everything else. They're not natural. Yeah. What Salt seed doesn't have to be a lawn. No, no. Clover, whatever. It can be gardens. Can be. Yeah, garden beds and those kind of things yeah. would also would also satisfy. But uh, yeah, no, no, that's that's the first we've heard that this change was just done at, uh, in October at the when we right down the you can have a look at I also <laughs> created some parking on the front. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, question on that sixty to eighty percent glazing, not on this page. Oh yes, yeah. But back there, uh, when you say. As long as we have mountain bars, though. are those the same ones as these ones, or would you be required to have the the SDLs? SDLs, the lines that sit on top. Oh of yeah, no, it could be the sort of the vinyl version, the the uh, the, the big ones. Want to say. Yeah, so it has to have the. I think that's exactly the word. I think the word is ones are the appearance of breaking it into themes um, in a traditional look. Uh, yeah. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I said, yeah. I see the cupola exemption on your six. No, there currently is not. It's a specific exemption. I'll vote for that. So, yes, the only other piece here is um, it, so this is we're, for this last bullet we're talking about. The, the brown area on the green and brown map, the outside area. Originally, we had also proposed some limitations on the siding materials in that area. Um, that was, we were directed to, to go back on that, and basically, so inside, inside the core uh, architectural area is where we'll have the, those strong provisions. Outside, we would not, as proposed, we would not limit metal or, or vinyl siding. Okay, as promised when I showed the map, these are just some of, I guess, probably the more significant changes. Uh, and I think some of the questions that came up earlier around the lot area and existing homes, maybe this potentially could be a good time to chat about those. So uh, quickly to go over it. Um, so there's some properties here along uh, Highway 3 um, for all of them, support. they're owned by the McDonald family. They were originally proposed to go to the red zone, which is the residential four 
uh, zone, um, they wrote into council and requested uh, that those properties maintain the existing commercial zoning that they have. And so they made a decision about uh, developing them. So that was uh, agreed to. There also is the lot here uh, adjacent to Peterson Lane. Um, it's vacant uh, currently under the current plan. The front half is zoned commercial, the back half is zoned residential. Uh, again, the property owner uh, wrote uh, into council and requested that that be made, like basically made all commercial and maintain the commercial piece and expand it. Um, and so that was agreed to as well. Um, a couple of just minor changes. There's a small piece of municipal property by Tan Cook Wharf, the open piece of green space. Uh, so we've adequately, or hopefully, appropriately so that parks an open space um, in you know future anticipation of lots of discussions around the future use of the Tan Cook Ferry Wharf, but maybe that parcel will become part of that um, part of that area as well. Um, and then in terms of areas that have actually had their zoning changed, there's two that I did want to highlight here that have changed since last summer. Um, so when we were talking about the residential one or the estate zone and the lot size going back to the 40,000 square feet, so that's the yellow zone here, um, generally large lots. There were two areas, there were basically in this, in this block, uh, there were, uh, most of those lots were zoned uh, estate residential or R1. When the decision was made to go, to go back to that larger lot size, it then warranted a closer look at the zoning for those lots. And the reason being that many of them, as you can see, are still in the original configuration from when the village plan was originally uh, plotted out. Those lots are, compared to the size that's intended for the estate zone, are very small. And the estate zone, or the R1 zone, um, has large setbacks of 25 feet from each property line in all four directions that you'd have to meet. And so we've had people in those zones that have actually had trouble building or developing because they're not able to meet those setbacks from property lines. Um, and it also, when when the zone, if the zone is going to change, those properties just really didn't fit the character of that of that R1 zone. So that area has been changed to R2, to which again it mirrored what was around it. The other area that I wanted to highlight is over here, uh, sort of on the Pig Loop, uh, Knox Point area. Uh, this, these, these lots that are now R2, originally were the R3 zone, which is the low density residential zone. When the proposal to reduce the size of R1 came in, I had proposed that they be under the R1 zone. But then again, when the change went back to say, no, large lot sizes for R1, again, these are small lots, they don't fit that, they're nowhere as close to that 40,000 square feet. Uh, and so I, I felt that the most appropriate zone was the R2 in that they, they matched that. They're, it's generally well, uh, pretty well built up in that area, so most, most of the properties are, are developed. I'm really confused because there are a lot of lots on the peninsula that are way smaller than what you were saying are required for uh, the R1 yes, zone. Yes, correct. So I do not see how the ones up by the old cemetery the Brunswick Street, Victoria Street, Regent Union don't meet, certainly meet the R1 protection. Um, so yeah, so, so you're right, there are, and this, there was a lot of back and forth on the R1, like reduction in lot size. Um, about 45% of the lots in the yellow area are less than 40,000 square feet, some significantly less. Um, so just for context, and that was made explicitly clear through all the discussions about reducing the lot size or keeping it the same. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that, is, that is the truth. There's no denying that. That said, um, again, these, these lots more closely resemble the other lots in the village core. And, and in part, it's the size, um, and in part, it's sort of the neighborhoods that they are, that they are in. So, um, I, you know, I think it would be a little harder, other than, you know, piecemealing specific lots, it would be a little harder to you know, pick and choose lots on the peninsula than to go to R2. Um, so, so that was the thing that was really, those lots kind of always stood out to me as being a, a bit out of sync with the zone that they were in. Uh, and so given all the discussion about the back and forth of the lot sizes and that the decision was made to keep them large, um, that, that felt like an appropriate change to consider. Okay. I, I just I mean, I'm from here, and I just think that there are certain large lots that are not protected, that are in the orange zone, that are defining features of 
some of the architecture and feel of Chester and to have them not protected um, from a developer coming in and chopping them up really goes against my grain because once it's gone, it's gone. It's not ever coming back. Yeah. And I think that's a, a huge loss. So the, yeah, no, fair, fair, fair comment. Uh, so the, the differences between those zones, just to kind of quickly highlight the one that the biggest one is the middle lot size and then the yard setbacks are very happy from the property lines. Uh, the lot coverages that we talked about earlier are to vary a little bit. Um, and the maximum size of footprint is quite a bit smaller in the R2 zone than it is in the, in the R1 zone. Um, so um, the architectural provisions beyond that in terms of the siding and the roofing and all that are the same. So those, those pieces are the same. But, um, and any, sorry, any existing buildings there obviously again would be... Would I guess be, I'm talking about the sprawling lawns, which would be gone. Right, mm -hmm. potentially if those, yeah. And some of them now are the house is on one, and then there's several other lots. There's nothing stopping And there, and there are already lots that are created. I think that's, it's, right. they look like one big lot, right. but they're already subdivided into smaller lots. Yeah. So, so the lots exist now. Right, right. and then, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very Yeah. I, I think she may have answered part of my question, but I was saying, when you're talking about allowing them to split them up into smaller lots, if that's an issue, Think about the water again. That's increasing the density. And if we don't have a water supply, that's something that you should be considering as to whether big lots can be split up. Right, and that was, I think, in part, that was part of the pushback to, to the change that was proposed in the, in the R1 zone. So. Um, that just sort of, I'm going to save this for later, but uh, I have a question. So in R2 zone, I know that it was Village Core. Uh, the number of duplexes in a row or within 70 yards or a block was prohibited. Is that still the case? Uh, no. So that's so, so that means so that means that every lot in R2 can have one or two units in it. Uh, yes. Okay. Can I just can I just expand on that? Currently, every one of those that was built before 2004 can also become a two unit. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and they are not. No, but I just the point being the the distance that you quoted there doesn't apply to residential conversions. It only applies to new two unit buildings. Right. So yeah. new two unit buildings seem to be a popular thing to build for developers because it's quantity and it's a lot easier to build two units at once than it is one house at once. I mean, it's a cost. So it's your good ratio, right? So you said to me the other day that every lot can have an accessory. Which means that a duplex can actually is actually for a developer a triplex. Yeah, if you if you're in a zone that allows a two unit, which is R two, okay. you can, you still are eligible for the accessory dwelling. So it's no longer a two unit; it's a three unit in a one or two unit zone. It's four units. That's what you make. No, if I have one house and I have an accessory unit, that's two units. If I build a duplex, that's two units. If I build a duplex and put an accessory in it, that is three units. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not just so, speeding. So what that does is, in a, a block, so I did a little bit of math, so we have about um, 35 blocks in R2, which is the old village core, not including the new R2 that you've given us. And this does have a point. Because uh, right now, so basically there are four lots per block, and I did this vertically, it averages out to about four lots north to south. I didn't do the cross sections. We end up with about 280 residential lots. So that means if there's one unit, there's 280 units. If there's two units, there's 560 units. If there's three units, there's 840 units. So if we have one person living in any of these, the numbers are the same for one. If we have four people living in uh, 280 units, we have 1,120 people. Two units, we have 2,240 people. And in three units, we have 3,360 people. The average person in Canada consumes 335 liters of water per day. Maximize it, this isn't going to happen, but it could. 280 lots then allow for 3,360 people to live there, which is 3,376,800 liters of water a day. 
But <coughs> so we cannot sustain who lives here now. How many people have cottage rules in August? Lots of us. I don't know how tripling the number of people in a block is going to be good for anything, especially water. Well, that's number one on the, on the yeah. list up there. Yeah. yeah, but this is the reality. We have yeah. worst case scenario. And we our roads can't handle yeah. this. And, and the thing is, too, I know this is about tax dollars. So we're about to make all kinds of tax dollars with all these new units. We are still going to get the same percentage out of the municipality, which means that we're no farther ahead in Chester itself. Because if we've got a million people and we only have a million dollars, that's all we have. If we have 100,000 people and we have $100,000, that's all we have. It's not going to make Chester better. Uh, so finally, here we're just about at the end. Uh, these are some of the changes to reflect all of the things we've talked about. So, in terms of the secondary planning strategy, we've made some policy changes to accompany uh, the, the regulatory changes. I think we pretty much talked about most of them there. The one that's crossed over is the Coastal Protection Act. Um, yeah, it's found lots of discussions needed there. Uh, that was quite recent and unfortunate. Um, so we kind of already went over next steps, basically. Uh, we'll be going back to council uh, likely at the end of April with a summary report from these sessions, and uh, we'll get some final direction for council to make changes, and then we hope to bring the final draft back to them uh, to begin the adoption process within the next few months. No hard and fast timeline. So thank you, everybody, for your patience. And oh, yeah, no, we're going to open to questions now, so don't worry. <laughs> um, so yes, now we will prepare it. Well, uh, there's a couple of things in zoning that haven't been brought up. And one, with the recent uh, scare that we had with Lordly Park, uh, has there any, been any discussion of uh, changing the zoning there to uh, parks and open space? Uh, yes and no. There's been some questions around changing the zoning. So currently, uh, Council and the Heritage Society have formed a committee uh, that is, um, their mandate is to sort all this out, basically, both in terms of what the Heritage Society so, um, so that said, currently the lots are zoned institutional. Um, under the current plan today, there is some residential potential that is possible in that zone uh, through a site plan approval. Like I mentioned earlier on the institutional zone page, there will not be a residential option going forward with the new plan. Whether or not we change it to a parks and open space zone uh, is yet to be determined, and I think it would be premature until that committee uh, does its work, basically. Because the, the original gift to Chester from the Magnotti or whatever yes. Uh, yes. family yes. specifically stated that this was to be always used as part of And that was given to the Heritage Society, yeah. and that's done as a covenant, is my understanding. So on the DD, there are some restrictions on some of the lots there. And the other thing that there are regards to zoning, uh, I live in the R4 district, uh, just uh, past the uh, train station. And I would like to see the core area extended, particularly uh, the end of uh, Queen and King Street uh, beyond Highway 3, uh, up towards like Gail Smith's house, the train station, my house, uh, right up to uh, Zinc Road is pretty much all traditional houses that have been there for a long time. And it is the entranceway to the village is what people see when they come to visit Chester, the entrance and, and along the Highway 3 there, all those nice old houses uh, don't have the same protection. And they are more in keeping with the R2 zone than, uh, than what the R4 for protections. So, so you're the architectural piece? Yeah, the yeah. architectural zone. Yeah. 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 Great, thank you. Any other? Yeah. Uh, just a couple of comments about this uh, uh, accessory dwelling units and accessory structures. Kind of like what gentleman was saying there. His math is kind of scary. Um, and I think that 
if this goes through the way it is, now I know you're going to make some changes, but I'm not sure which ones yet. We'll find out with the public hearings or whatever. But I think we're going to have problems with water in the future because we're going to add too many buildings and too many too many people. And all those buildings will cover all the backyards and soak up the water now. And uh, I think that's council being a little short-sighted in you know trying to get so much development, density, density. It's something that this community never asked for. And I think Chester is developing on its own slowly. But you know, I think this is a drastic move. I and mean, I'm just getting my words in now because that's how I feel. I've lived here my entire life. I served as a council for eight years. And I've seen a lot of changes even in those times. But this plan here is, you know, although you do a great job in presenting and it's got some great, great things in it, I, I think that we're going to, the only way that you can really protect the water is to make those accessory dwelling units lots bigger. Uh, they used to be 10,000 square feet, and it was not long ago that they got changed. Uh, even I think we're talking was on council in 208, I think we changed it back. But I think the council needs to look at this water situation. And what further backs me up is that council the last two years, two years ago, or maybe even a year ago, got a water report. And it, 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 it stressed that we shouldn't do a lot of development in the village. Mm -hmm. You know, it, their own reports said don't do a lot of development. But here we are talking about adding hundreds of buildings in the village. And it's quite disturbing to me. It's almost like the provincial government or the federal government are going ahead and ignoring their own reports. So I'd like to know why is council still persisting upon this density thing? Why don't we slow it down a bit and listen to what people have to say? Who are going to live here? Who are going to pay for it? And 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 then maybe perhaps we want if we get water, uh, you know, then I think that's the appropriate time to increase the density. Don't increase the density first and then try to find some water. That's that's ridiculous. But. That's just my opinion. Thank you. I have one other question. No one has mentioned sewer. Yeah. That's and, and I was always under the impression in recent years that it was always at capacity. But there's been more new houses built in the last few years. And that sewage hasn't changed. It's still at capacity. So where's the capacity? So it actually was found to not not be at capacity, and with oh. some with some upgrade work, which is underway now, and we've got some funding for that. Um, there will be at, at least at first an additional 500 units of capacity in the okay. in the current system. So. Okay. <clears throat> so I think I can, just to answer that, I think you're right. I think at one point it was thought that it was. And then there was an investigation and reporting done that found that with you know relatively wider upgrades, there was some additional water I just wanted to speak to your point that um, I read somewhere that the uh, the conservatives federally who are not in power now um, said that they plan to penalize municipalities that don't get on board with development. Our population in Canada has increased by 2 million people, I think, over the last year or two years. So the people are coming, and I think that's where this big push, this is just more of a comment, is coming, because all the people are coming, but like you said, we don't have the water, but we also don't have the housing. So I think, um, I feel like there's pressure coming from, like a top-down pressure, because I don't get the impression that a lot of people in this room really want like any of what we're talking about. And, and I don't even own a house here. Yeah. Like I just rent like on the highway, so I'm not like living large in Chester, but it just seems weird because it doesn't feel like it's a, a ground up movement. I was just going to add to the population, there are four, about 40 corner commercial lots in the corner, and you're allowed to have 10 units per lot. So that's another 400 units for two people per unit, it's another 800 people. That's just the corner lot. That's not the <laughs> yeah, that's not the <laughs> and I did the numbers on how many commercial lots there are in a row. It's all about the small business. Don't be sure your works if you check it out. <laughs> uh, and the uh, growth rate right now in Nova Scotia is like about 1.7. So when I did a growth rate on a population of 15,000, at 2%, that's 300 people, which we need approximately 150 units for. And if they're going to do three units per lot, that means 50 off lots are going to be turned into triplexes to house those people. <laughs> <laughs> Can we close the loop on the conversation about the ownership of, of the property under the current uh, 
fire station. Eric, can you speak to the future use of the fire hall if the fire hall moves the property now? There's no determination yet made on, on the ownership of that. It's owned by the village. It's owned by the village. So that's, that's all we have this time. In, in uh, discussions that uh, various people have been having recently, uh, it did come up that uh, considering our water problems, uh, that maybe we should be considering uh, water towers. And actually, Chester has a history of water towers way back, former Hobo uh, had a water system in Chester, and there was about five water towers. The fire hall property would be an ideal situation to put water towers in. It's a high piece of land. It's close to a wetland. Um, what better use could we have? Let's start thinking outside of piping in water from lakes and there's lots of water coming from the sky. We have to, we could collect it and save it for the whole year. And uh, if we're built on a high point of land, the gravity feed, and we could have a, maybe a series of wells that could be triple fed from these uh, storage units and uh, could go a long way. I think we should have to start, we have that potential property, which gives a lot of credence to moving the fire department. And just on, to the same point, is there, should there be a requirement that people install systems on new builds, commercial or residential or whatever? I mean, you know, we're, we have to look, we have to look into the future here. Yeah, that was, that actually was suggested uh, last summer, yeah. we that as well. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I know last year about larger commercial buildings having to do a report on how much water they plan on using and how they're going to offset their use. So I think that I like the idea of the what the surface water says, but that's just kind of masking over the real problem. The real problem is how much water is that building going to consume, not how much water is it going to stop from being collected. Are there any restrictions around? I know some places restrict gathering water on your own property. Are there any restrictions around that? No, there's nothing, nothing restricting it. Um, yeah, it's just not a requirement, I guess, yeah. Follow up question? <laughs> a different point, actually. Um, Specktville Lake was um, assessed as a potential yeah. source. Were any other lakes? Um, not to my knowledge. I know, I mean, I know Stanford Lake was definitely ruled out because it's shallow and has toxic metals and, like that. So, that, but to my knowledge, Spectacle Lake has always been the kind of set aside as a potential source, and the zoning around it uh, goes right around the, the watershed collection area. And that's been in place, I think, since the 90s, um, as a as maybe the potential. So, um, I, I would, although, you know, like the suggestion that just came up about, you know, wells and tanks, I, I don't know if Public Works is looking at that kind of thing, but my understanding is that I think we're probably moving away from surface water for. Variety of reasons, partially because of the treatment required. Yeah. Okay, well, if that's it, um, yeah, that's it. That was great. That was a lot of comments and discussions. So, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, like we said, we will uh, obviously we recorded this. We'll be summarizing uh, all the notes to go back to council. We've got the parking lot. And the video recording, and uh, again, please keep, in, uh, keep your eye open for when this goes to council.